Hello once again to uh, another video from Accept Truth with Joy. It's been a while since I've posted something, but I found something kind of interesting a couple months ago that I wanted to make a little video on. I haven't really done one of these. It's kind of going to be like a response video to something that I saw on the web. And th uh, this video really is about um, this person that I don't know, but who came here to Utah and went to the um, the Bean Life Science Museum up at BYU and kind of went through some of the exhibits, particularly the exhibits on evolution, and kind of was making their own video about it. And so I just want to like watch some of what they did and then interject my, um, my thoughts about what they were saying on this. And this also has to do with this, um, so this comes from this guy named Dr. Bob, apparently, who runs, the, runs this site that um, is like the Flood Museum. Um, Noah's World and the Global Flood. So it's kind of this creationist Noah's Flood um, type thing. And they are, apparently he has some kind of museum um, back, back east, but he's planning on creating something or there's a group of people who are planning on kind of replicating that uh, here in Lehigh is my understanding. Um, don't know all the details about that, but this is how it kind of came on, came to me was uh, people told me about this, and so I went and looked into this and wanted to do a little response video to this guy's video that he did at the BYUB Museum. So we'll just kind of watch some of his stuff, and then uh, I'll just stop it and, and interject. Hi, it's Dr. Bob, and today we are at the Bean Museum, which is the Life Sciences Museum at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. So I just want to mention that the doctor in Dr. Bob comes from, I, th I think it's like a... a what is it, like a theological seminary and college of the Bible um, type institution. It's not accredited by any government, um, in, you know, by the state or by the United States, but but I think it is uh, associated with other Christian, you know, seminary type um, degree granting uh, institutions. But it's definitely not a doctorate or a PhD in biology or in evolution. Um, we're here to look at their human origins exhibit and to understand how universities all over the country are presenting this idea of human origins and the concept of evolution of, of, of humans. Um, it's interesting because as you look at universities all across the country, um, the top tier, even the religious schools, uh, top tier religious schools across the country all have an affiliation or association with a museum um, that has a, an exhibit similar to this one. Um, it's interesting that this one is here right on campus. Um, that tells us a lot about uh, what's going on in these universities because why would a religiously affiliated university choose to adopt a, an approach that is so anti-biblical? I'll take a stab at that question because universities are trying to, well, one of the, one of the points of the university is to find truth, right, and to teach truth. And so universities teach what the, what the overwhelming evidence has demonstrated as the objective truth reality of our planet. And that, in, in this case, is that evolution is the best, uh, the, the, the best idea that we have to explain the diversity of life on this planet. Um, well, the, the real reason is the acceptance of the university by the scientists and the scholars of the world. Um, and that's the same thing that's happened here, uh, where the door is open to allow more liberal um, uh, professors and, and teaching in order to gain acceptance from the broader, broader world. As someone with two degrees from Brigham Young University, that does not describe their uh, mission statement at all. And so we're going to go in and we're going to see just how human origins is presented an exhibit like this one and how it relates to to us and what it says about the uh, the worldview of the universities that present these type of exhibits. Uh, this exhibit is, presents this idea of human evolution in a very unique way. Notice that the, the fossil skulls that are presented here are presented on a family tree type model. Um, and of course you see all these kids going around everybody wants to see how they fit in this grand scheme and how, where their place is on this family tree. 
kind of reminiscent of a genealogical tree. These skulls represent a lot of different approaches. You'll see here Australopithecus afarensis, Lucy. Um, and of course, um, Lucy was presented by Donald Johansson as being the kind of the epitome of, of a human origins uh, 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 candidate. And yet now we know that, uh, that Lucy was just simply an ape. Well, that's a convenient way to just throw out an entire <laughs> species that exists in hominin evolution. Uh, we are very confident, and there's been hundreds of scientists, maybe thousands, that have have looked at uh, the hominin evolution tree, and we there is a strong consensus that Australopithecus afarensis is first of all a different genus, Australopithecus, and second of all a different a species within that genus where there are are, are also a bunch of other species. So to just blow all of that off and say, oh, it's just an ape, where? Where's your citation? Where's your evidence? Because the scientific consensus disagrees with that statement. Um, as we go to Cro-Magnon Man up here, um, Cro-Magnon Man is human. Um, and Neanderthal, of course, is human. Um, each of these, like when you look at your, your, uh, your own DNA, you'll see that you'll have a, a percentage of your DNA that they might say that you're like 3% Neanderthal. Um, all that really is indicating is just like your 3% European or your some um, percentage of your ancestry comes from a specific region or area. And that's exactly where Neanderthal fits. So actually not a bad description here of the relationship of modern Homo sapien to Cro-Magnon and to Homo neanderthalensis. Um, it's interesting that we, we obviously have the DNA for Homo neanderthalensis, and so therefore he's okay with making this ancestral uh, relationship, right? And that we share a percentage of DNA with them. Um, what we don't have, obviously, is the DNA for all of these other species because they're too ancient. The, DNA, the fossils that were found do not contain biological material where we could sequence the DNA, although we do have this for a few other of the specimens on that wall. So I actually decided to just go in and find the data that exists for some of these other species. And it turns out that we do have quite a few of the other species. I actually uh, went and grabbed all that sequence data and made a sequence alignment, used a NG phylogeny to do this. So this is the mitochondrial genome for all of these different species of Homo sapiens and, and uh, Altai and Denisova and gorillas and chimpanzees and so forth. And this alignment then shows all of the similarities and differences in the DNA in the mitochondrial genomes. And of course, this is a huge alignment. This goes all the way over, all the way over to nearly 16,000 base pairs, like 15,400 and something base pairs. So a huge uh, uh, data set here. And I ran the alignment on it and, and uh, did the phylogenetic reconstruction. And here's the tree. And I rooted the tree to Hylobates, a gibbon. And then we have the orangutan, a gorilla, chimpanzees, and the, the, both the bonobo and the chimpanzee. And then everything else are these specimens that we have DNA for. Now, of course, we have tons of Homo sapien um, specimens. We have actually quite a few of Homo neanderthalensis. I only included two Homo sapiens, one neanderthalensis. And then I included the other three specimens or species, essentially, that we have DNA for, their entire mitochondrial genomes for. So we have Homo heidelbergensis, Homo sapiens um, from Denisova, the Denisovan group, and then Altai. And you can see how these are related. So yeah, I mean, kind of what he's saying is correct. Like we share a certain amount of DNA with Neanderthals, but we also share a certain amount of DNA with heidelbergensis and sapiens and Altai. And then we share a certain amount of DNA with chimpanzees and gorillas and so forth. And we share DNA because we have common ancestry. And after the ancestors split into the two different lineages, then mutations start to accumulate and the DNA gets a little bit more different with every successive generation. So I just wanted to also uh, look into that real quick. Um, in this exhibit, um, evolution is presented um, as if it's factual. Um, in fact, the, uh, the, the, the statement that they make here is the theory of evolution is not someone's guess. The theory describes a well-established and documented scientific process, even though that's not the case. Now, some of the scientific processes that they point to as being indicative of evolution are things like homology um, and embryo development, um, all things which have been disproven. And we know that they're not indications 
of an evolutionary process, but simply indications of a creator God who created each of us out of the same materials to exist in the same environment. Here he's starting to show his lack of understanding. Homology is defined in biology as similarity due to common ancestry. So by definition, homology is the description of an evolutionary process. And then he also, you know, was, was saying that embryonic development is not um, evidence of evolution. Well, yes, it is. And, as, and that's just one of them, too. There's plenty, plenty of other things that are also evidences of evolution. So he's already showing his uh, lack of knowledge in what, what are the real principles of evolutionary biology. And so what we really get a chance to see is how these philosophies of men, this, this religion of evolution. Evolution is not a religion, just as gravity or germ theory or, or any other scientific theory is not an, a religion. Has now become entrenched in, um, in new temples uh, that are represented by these universities all over the country. Now why would this model be uh, presented in a university like this? Well, it's simply to get the, gain the acceptance of the world, but it also allows for a lot of other um, philosophies and, and ideas to intrude, on, um, to intrude on the things that are taught here. So evolution isn't simply something that's taught in the biology or science classes. It intrudes into philosophy, um, into sociology, into anthropology. And so we start getting these ideas of primitive man and um, the development of ideas instead of looking at us as being creators or creatures of a creator. Um, it's interesting as we look at this that you see all these children going around. They all want to figure out where they fit in this world. And it's being presented as if it's factual. And it's being presented as if it is even in this case, because we're talking about religious schools adopting this, um, that it is consistent with faith. Um, implying that God hasn't spoken on his creation and that he hasn't already told us how he did this and why he did it. So this part's interesting because he's, he's basically questioning BYU, a religious school, you know, why would they be having these, um, you know, exhibits on evolution. And apparently he didn't pay very good attention because on his way to that exhibit, he walked down the hallway of reconciliation where the BYU professors and uh, the, the Life Science Museum has an entire display, has videos playing of how well-meaning, uh, believing scientists take both their science serious and their religion serious and how they try to make those things work. And he just apparently just walked right on by all of that and acts as if BYU is somehow naive to, 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 to that way of, of forming a worldview. Um, so this really calls into question a lot of those things. Now each of these skulls, as we go through uh, uh, all the Australopithecus, um, supposed ancestors have all now been indicated to be ape ancestors. And many of the others are considered to be simply human. Uh, but when we look at the variety of the skulls and the fragmentary evidence that's available for these, um, they kind of give us an idea that, may, that there is a pattern or a path that's created here um, because of the way that they are presented on this chart. But they are not indicative of evolutionary processes, but more indicative of a worldview of the people who built the exhibit and the science, the scientists that have uh, supported this type of philosophy. Um, it's interesting because even Richard Dawkins, um, he has a famous quote where he said that the only problem with evolution um, in being adopted by more people is they don't have imagination. Um, because it does require imagination. You'll notice most of the, the methods that are used here are cartoon creations. Um, because there are not any, there isn't any hard evidence to point to for these ideas. This is just ridiculous. This so-called Dr. Bob clearly has not taken a real look at the evidence that does exist. Uh, we have, again, like I've said, hundreds and thousands of scientists who have studied this and are studying this right now. And it continues to be the most overwhelming supported idea in biology. And so for him to just go, oh, well, I don't think that there's enough evidence, it's just, it's, it's, it's almost, um, it's actually a little demeaning the way that he's, he, he says that because it makes it f seem like all of my colleagues, the, the thousands of people who have worked on this problem, that, that all of their research is for naught and that we're, we're somehow in a huge conspiracy and that we're, we are 
trying to fool the world for some reason about this. It's just, it's really just crazy. Um, in Darwin's 100th anniversary uh, publish, publication of Origin of the Species, um, there's a great quote, and uh, the, 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 it, it simply points to the fact that the, uh, while there's no evidence to support, and this was in 1959, while there's no evidence to support evolution and, and, and its scientific viability, um, it is still presented and supported because the alternative is untenable. Um, the idea that a creator God would have made us is unacceptable to this, this group, um, to these, these scientists. And now he has gone to the uh, trope that is always used, where supposedly there are only two possible options. Either it has to be evolution or it has to be Judeo-Christian creationism and that those are the only possible options. And so this is a, also a, um, a uh, tactic that has been used by the fundamentalist creationists for a long, long time, where they try to set up that if evolution isn't true, right, if I can poke holes in enough, or at least in your mind, that maybe there's some doubts about evolution, then, then the obvious alternative and only possible alternative is Judeo-Christian creationism, fundamentalist, six-day or young earth creationism. But of course, that's, those are not the only two possibilities. Um, and, there, and there are plenty of believing scientists who accept evolution as the method in which the diversity of life came up on, uh, came about on planet earth. And that maybe some form of deity, whatever that is, is somehow involved, but the, the intervention of that deity is unsure of. So this, this idea that, that, that he's trying to get people to buy into, that there's only two possible options, this false dichotomy, is also just insane. And so now it's found its way into even religious schools um, and causing this, the great divide that we've seen as Satan's war has, a, has, a, has a encroached on these religious schools. So when we look at this stuff, it's reasonable to say, why do they believe that? What evidence actually points to the, to the assumptions and the conclusions that they're making? And is it valid? Wow, he is standing on a mountain of irony right now as well, as he's saying, what evidence do we have as he's standing in front of all of those fossil organisms uh, behind him? <laughs> it's really quite amusing. And as we'll see, as we go through um, this exhibit, um, there is no validity to the things that are being taught. They are simply assumptions, they are guesses, and they support a worldview that is anti-God. This portion of the Human Origins exhibit here at the Bean Museum presents a completely discredited uh, version of uh, the science for human development. Um, as you'll see up here, first off it's talking about during fetal development all vertebrates have gills and tails, which is now known to not be true. Of course it goes back to Hickel's diagrams, but uh, it, it's, it's been uh, eradicated from, from most biological um, textbooks. This is not being accurate either. Now, of course, the use of the word gill is probably not the right scientific term. We mostly would use the words pharyngeal arches or visceral arches, or maybe even gill arches. But remember, this is a museum that's kind of trying to inform young, you know, young uh, students and um, especially young elementary age kids even about these relationships of structures that early on are present in lots and lots of organisms and then they change over time through the embryological development into different structures. And the pharyngeal arches are, are a good example of this. So perhaps in the museum they could have said pharyngeal arches to be a little bit more accurate. But it's not that this has been disproven that these things don't exist and that they don't develop into different things in different organisms. That still is true. Except when you're talking about kids apparently. Um, and then the same thing with homology. As we look at these different constructions of, of bones and everything, um, this idea that you can support evolution um, through homology has again been discredited. And the idea um, that the relationship that we have to each other physiologically and the, the commonality, that somehow that is support for evolution, um, again, is not supported by the actual science, but is more indicative of a, uh, of a creator using the same materials to create creatures that are going to live in the same environment. Okay, as we look here at the skeletons that have been created um, for each of these um, of each of these fossils. Um, of course, Australopithecus afarensis, Lucy, gets uh, prime billing again. 
um, in spite of the f and showing her walking bipedally, um, in spite of the fact that the scientific evidence now points to the fact that she uh, was a quadruped, not a but not bipedal. Once again, he just is completely misstating the best accurate science that we have, the scientific consensus on this issue. Australopithecines were um, uh, have all the evidence to show that they were bipedal. We even have the footsteps in Laetoli that show that they were bipedal because there's no knuckle walking anywhere. This guy has no idea what he's talking about when it has to do with how do we determine whether something is bipedal or not. He's completely unqualified to even talk about this subject. Um, in fact, the, uh, the, the uh, hip bones that are represented there, of course, they reconstructed with the gray material, bone that was never found. But even the, the part that is, uh, that is a, a cast of the original um, bones that were found um, had to be modified to give it the characteristics of being able to walk in an upright uh, uh, position. When it was first discovered by Donald Johansson's team, it was flared upright like a chimpanzee. That's the record that we have. Um, and there's a famous National Geographic video that shows them with a, with a Dremel tool grinding it to get it back into place to where now it would be able to, to support a bipedal creature. Okay, I don't have the time to debunk this um, claim here, but uh, there's this great video that you, I'll, I'll link to it in the, in the, in the description here, I'll, and I'll put them up here, but it's from Professor Dave Explains, and he has this video called Exposing the Discovery Institute, Part 1, Casey Luskin, and he basically debunked, he goes through this supposed video from National Geographic, and then just goes through it and just demolishes the, uh, in this case, it's an intelligent design creationist who's, who's trying to show that, uh, that they manipulated the fossil. So it's beautiful. If you're really interested in this, uh, in debunking this one, go check that video out. It's awesome. Um, so again, uh, no indications that it was bipedal, but uh, we still have it represented here in the museum as uh, bipedal. Homo ergaster, um, presented as a hominid um, ancestor, but no, no indicating support for that. Um, Homo neanderthalis, of course, the Neanderthal, of course, we know is just simply us. And then Homo sapiens, um, but it is great that because they do show the skeletons of the chimpanzees as well. And as you look at, at Lucy in comparison to the bonobo and to the chimpanzee, you realize there's a much greater relationship between those than there is between um, Australopithecus afarensis and, uh, and a Homo sapien. Um, in fact, Australopithecus, all of that uh, group has now been pretty, pretty clearly indicated to be ape-like and not hominins. So one more uh, example here at the Bean Museum of Human Evolution being presented as factual and even misrepresenting the orientation of the, of the skeletons in order to, to further that message. Of course, Lucy was even found over a several square mile um, area implying that all those bones were somehow related to the same animal. Um, so an interesting presentation, um, obviously with an agenda that is, that is unique from um, the actual factual evidence, but more to support a worldview. Um, and so we have to ask, what worldview is that? And it's an anti-God worldview. Wow, never thought I'd heard someone claim that BYU has an anti-God worldview. Um, where things simply happen on their own self-determination of material and of organisms through the evolutionary processes. This is Dr. Bob here at the Human Origins Exhibit in Provo, Utah. Well, that was interesting. Um, you know, they've apparently are moving forward with this museum in Lehigh. Um, I, they have the address even posted uh, on their website. And I don't know. I mean, maybe they're going to try to do something here. I sure hope that uh, uh, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and others in the community as a whole basically reject this stuff because this is this is not good. We don't need it in our community. Uh, students don't need to listen to this. It's really quite terrible. You can be serious to the science and you can also have belief in deity if you so wish. I mean, that's what the rest of my channel is basically dedicated, right, to that, that kind of thinking. But we do not need to entertain fundamentalist, creationist, young earth, intelligent design thinking. That stuff we should just stay as far away as possible. And uh, this is a great example of why we should stay away from that. Sunshine with me. The doors are open, the skies are too. Sunshine is coming in for me and you. Sunshine.